All right, so we're continuing with the install of my rear differential. So despite what a spreadsheet may say, or some gauge trick may say, it all comes down to if this isn't, if this doesn't look good, whatever some calculation chart said to adjust the pinion depth, it doesn't matter. So uh, Chris is turning away. Unfortunately, I got to make his job a little bit harder by adding some resistance on this. If we don't have some resistance, we don't kind of scar up our gear marking compound. And, and that's what we're really trying to do is, is to see exactly where these teeth are riding on each other and the gear marking compound is going to show us that. So right now we're driving in reverse. I'm not going very fast, but <laughs> eventually we're going to get there. Being the engine is not really that fun of a job. I see you picked being the resistance. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sound effects make this part go a lot smoother. I like the Mazda vroom vroom. <laughs> what do those markings tell you? This is so close to being really good, but to, to get it a little bit better, which would be absolutely perfect, um, we're going to make the pinion a little bit deeper. What that'll do is that's going to give us a little bit less contact towards the very edge of that tooth. So even though the way it's riding right now, there is a pretty big contact surface print area, but it's it's a, a little close to that corner. I don't think it's riding over the top of the corner right now, but it's like right at the edge of it. If you really set these up really good, I mean, you know, premium, you know, high performance type gear installation, that gives us the the extra confidence to set our backlash up even tighter. So if we set this up kind of sloppy, then we can set the backlash up around 10,000 or so, and, and there's going to be enough space that it, they probably would, they would ride good. But since we like to set everything up at the very, very tightest end of the range, We, we want it all, all kind of tighter. You'd think if you owned your own shop, you'd get some sort of like tool usage priority. priority. But it turns out it doesn't work that way. <laughs> All right, so what you didn't see here is after we pulled that pinion out, uh, Paul went and removed the bearings and reshimmed it for a new pinion depth and then put the bearings back on and now we're reinstalling this back into the housing. So uh, I didn't figure you need to see that process again. When I'm spinning this in reverse, this is really what we call the cosine of the teeth. Or, you know, reverse. But a lot of people refer to it as the coast. And you can tell a lot by the coast. Because sometimes the way that the teeth ride on it a little bit differently than the drive. So sometimes it's harder, it's easier to see the coast pattern than it is the drive pattern. And that's absolutely textbook perfect. So you can see that the contact pattern is even this way and it's even this way. And the main key that we're really looking at 
is the fact that we have no contact on that top corner of the drive side. And we really are achieving the exact same thing on the coast side. It's not a triangulated contact pattern. It's, it's almost kind of a rectangular mm -hmm. contact shape. We have a pain preload to do. We have to grind some grooves in this. Get an airline in, and we still are going to get this carrier tighter. So in that goes, in the crush sleeve, if things go well, this will be the last time the bearings come out. But it won't be the last time the pinion comes out. The pinion got comes off in the yoke. So what's the purpose of the crush sleeve? It allows us to set up pain preload tension, which means how much force is squeezing those two um, tapered bearing sets. So since the races are tapered outwards, the bearings are combed inwards. So how much force is on that Got it. dictates how, how snug it is. So too tight and they're going to run hot. They're just going to run hot all the time no matter what. Too loose, they can chatter. So from axle to axle and based on the size of the bearings and the length of the pinion itself um, really kind of dictates the range of uh, tightness that's at, that's allowed and, and it's measured in inch pounds so there's a, a moving tension that we measure with a with a special tool when we get that far um, so we ignore the breakaway tension as far as what it takes to get it to start moving but while it's turning it's a special torque wrench that sees the rotating tension of the bearings themselves and that's measured in inch pounds Cool. And it's called pinion preload tension. It's very, very important. A little bit more. And this little bit on turning it is enough to make it too tight. Really? That's why I'm going just a little tiny bit at a time. So what we've done to this point is we've crushed the crush leaves enough that there's no more movement in here on our very solidly mounted tool. So if there was a little wiggle room in these bearings, you could feel it and you could hear it because this is bolted on solid here and there's a pretty big lever. So we have no movement, but we also have no tension yet. So there's no tension. The slop is out but there's no tension. So the next step that we do is we, we're gonna remove the old pinion nut and we're gonna put the other hardware that belongs inside, which is a, a little slinger washer and the seal. And then we're gonna close this up final with all the new parts. And we're gonna, we're gonna tighten this at very, very tiny increments back and forth with check-in with the, with the tool. No, I was going to get four of these ones. Okay. They do make special seal driver for that, but our special seal installation socket has put in just hundreds of seals. <laughs> and it, at this point, it just seems like a step backwards to replace. All right, so this is the seal that came with the kit. Unfortunately, little parts number check. This is for a front end Dana 44 and we're doing work on a rear end. So this didn't work, but good news is Paul had the right one in the shop. So you can put, put a pretty big effort in getting the seal in just right, and being real meticulous about all that, just to find out that it seems like it leaks because 
it's coming up the splines. Oil's making its way up the spline. And then the inside of the double lip pinion seal will be filled with grease. And the outside of the pinion seal we coated with RTV as well. We're also going to apply a pretty generous amount of red Loctite. And we've used solvent again to make sure that these threads are nice and clean and dry. We also look at the new pinion nut and make sure it's not had been packed in oil to keep it from rusting is, is common from a lot of manufacturers. And this is a crush nut, the very end of it is purposely deformed to make it tight to prevent it from vibrating loose. Notice our high lift jack handle. Yeah. That's makes what, a great cheater bar. That's what I use my handle for. Just to trade places. Right <laughs> <laughs> now it's really tight. You can see it's the pinion preload tension is just starting to support the weight of our tool here. So the tool has to be removed to get a real measurement of the preload tension because the weight of the tool um, is a big factor. Alright, let's check it. So we're about 15 inch pounds right now. And so we're ignoring the breakaway tension and we're watching the movement in inch pounds. So we're riding around 15 to 16 inch pounds. And spec is 20? 22 to 35. Okay. So what we're going for is really trying to move this the absolute smallest amount I possibly can, which is hard to do at the end of a bar in this wall. But it's also hard to get it to move. We were, this is really is getting tight. It moved just a little bit. That's a. All right. Let's see how you did. All right, the moment of truth. It is. We're 24. <laughs> 23, 24. And this spec is what? 22 to 35. 22, so you're just within. Yep. So we're not gonna try the monkey with this. We're gonna leave this be. And you can feel that there is a, some tension here. 